Now, uh, we've had a rather charged atmosphere the last week or so in America, haven't we? It's been uh, kind of a nail biter for everybody who cares on both sides of the fence, both sides of the aisle. And uh, some of these things still are not decided yet. I think probably Floridians and Arizonans and Tennesseans are not going to have any fingernails left by the end of the week. But uh, uh, I'll tell you what, many stayed up late to see the results. Couldn't wait. It's so close. I stayed up late. And I, pray, I, I paid for it the next day. I did. My, I'd try to study in my eyes and just go like this, you know. But, um, you know, some raised their hands triumphantly and others shook their fists defiantly as the House arms itself, the Senate stands guard. So where does it all go? It goes exactly where God's going to send it. Amen. And uh, Psalm 2, 4 says, He sitteth in the heavens, he that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh and the Lord shall have them in derision. I'll tell you what, God is still the God of this world. He's still, what a mighty God we serve, amen? And uh, regardless of what has happened in any election, past, present, or future, God is still almighty. And there are four things I want to point out to us this morning that this election and no election will ever change. Everybody went to the polls. But the election did not change the omnipotence of God. Omnipotence means all-powerful. He holds all power. He is all power. He is almighty, and there is none other than he. God is powerful. He can do anything that is consistent with his character. And he can do anything that he desires to do. The only thing that he can't do one of the things he can't do is think up stupid questions. Can God make a rock too big for him to pick up? Well, why would he? God will do all things he wills to do. All things he sets out to do. And all things that he plans to do. He's all-powerful. God has a plan for us. God has a plan for the world. God has a plan uh, for this nation. I'm glad that uh, we still have the freedom to worship God, to come to church, to talk to people about the Lord. We basically although they threaten it all the time, we have freedom to be Christians and to live as Christians and to evangelize as Christians. They're always trying to beat down these Christian kids in, in high schools. It's, they're always in the news. From time to time, you'll pick up on a story of someone who wants to wear a, a patriotic or a Ten Commandment uh, a t-shirt or carry their Bible to school or speak up for the Lord. Praise God that so far, when they press it, these Christian kids win in court every time. And I thank God for their stamina and their bravery and their courage to speak up for God and what's right. God is the creator of all things. But we must also remember he is the final disposer of all things. God is the blessing of all things good 
and the terror of all things evil. In the end, evil does not win. Hebrews 13, 6, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Our election did not change the omnipotence of God. When communism triumphed in Russia and China and Asia and Vietnam, it did not change the omnipotence of God. Every atheist will stand before God's judgment seat without excuse and they will know, they will know, they will know of their foolishness and the Bible says that even on those days every, na, uh, every knee shall bow before Almighty God. But for the lost, it's too late. You have but one opportunity to accept Christ uh, in your lifetime, and that is in your lifetime. Should you die without acknowledging Jesus Christ, it'll be too late. And those thundering words from the scripture will come through, depart from me, ye who work iniquity, I never knew you. And over and over again in the Bible, it teaches us and shows plainly that man is without excuse. If you've made excuses in your lifetime, why you have yet to give your life to Christ, you will be without excuse when you stand before God. The omnipotence of God was not changed. And I believe that he who sits in the seat of government and, and in the kingships of the world, that they are God's appointment either for our chastisement or our blessing, but they are by God. I mentioned this last week and somebody said, well, if God... Uh, is the final chooser of those who will rule over us. Why did you vote? Because I love voting and I love being an, a, a redneck, redneck American. Besides, I think Christians ought to be heard from. I wonder if we have been. I wonder why political conservatives are better heard than we. I don't want the world to hear that I'm a conservative. I want them to hear that I'm a Christian. There is a difference. We ought to pray for the voice in this, uh, of this nation that Christians will be heard. Not because they're pro-life, but because they're pro-Christ. Not because we love the Constitution, but because we love the Bible. I think a lot of Christians have become intimidated, especially on the college campuses. I was at a gas station this past week, an older gentleman was taking my money and uh, he was proud to be a voting American. He says, it took me, I don't know what nation he came from, it happened to have taken him 22 years to become a citizen of the United States of America. And he said this, I thank God for this country. Four things the elections did not change. It didn't change the omnipotence of God. Number two, 
It did not change the word of God. Not the written word, not the incarnate word. The divinely inspired, supernaturally preserved, written word of God is indestructible. Burn a thousand copies and we'll print ten thousand more. It's unchangeable, it's unalterable, and it shall never return unto God void. It's still as appropriate today as the day it was written. This is an ageless book. It does not need to be updated. Because God's truth is always God's truth, will always be God's truth, and will forever be God's truth. Isaiah 55, 11, he shall, uh, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. Last week I spoke of the inspiration and preservation of the scriptures. I did not make this a statement, but I probably should have. Every modern translation dies within 25 to 30 years. Where's the living Bible? Good luck finding one on a, on a, a shelf for sale. Where is the old Revised Standard Version? Where is the uh, American Standard Version? Where is the uh, uh, ASB? Where are all of these? They've been taken place by the newest ones, the ESB being one of them. There's been a copy of the Word of God on the shelf for hundreds of years. And it's not going anywhere. It's still, out, it's still outprinted. Excuse me. There are more King James Bibles pr printed than, in, than any other translation. There are more King James Bibles given away than any other translation. There are more King James Bibles sold than any other translation. And when the prophets run out on the ESB, there'll be another one on its tail. I say death proves counterfeit. Those are strong words. Say, preacher, don't you think the, uh, the, the ESV contains the, uh, uh, the word of God? I, I do believe it contains the word of God but it contains a lot of men's words too. And under the curse of Revelation 22, they've added and subtracted from the word of God. I don't want something that contains the word of God. I want something that is the word of God. The elections did not change anything about that, did it? It didn't change the incarnate word of God. It's when, the, when the, the word of God became flesh and dwelt among us. 1 John 1, 14, or John 1, 14, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Listen, the incarnate word of God, Jesus Christ, after he paid for the sins of this world, with his shed blood and took our death penalty upon himself. Returned unto the Father, but he returned to his throne. And they can try to discredit him, hate him, outlaw him, kick him out, but they're powerless against the incarnate word of God.
Jesus Christ did not get off his throne last week. Not one plan was altered. People are still accepting Christ as their Savior. People are still getting saved around the world. And he's coming back. He's coming back on time in the very moment divinely appointed. And the election did not change that. In fact, the Father hath appointed the Son to be judge of all men forever. John 5, 22, For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. When he does come, say, I'm looking forward to the rapture. Yeah, I know, but that is not the second coming. The rapture and the second coming are different. I'm looking forward to the rapture, amen? But in seven years beyond that, after the, the world and its nations have been turned to just short of ashes, he will come. And he will fight Armageddon and set up his thousand-year kingdom and he will rule with a rod of iron. Say, so why does he have to rule with a rod of iron? Surely when they see him, uh, they'll all just submit and be saved and, and put their faith in him. Listen, for a lot of pe uh, people, seeing is not believing. And during the... Uh, kingdom, the nations of the world will be ruled unwillingly, but ruled with a rod of iron. Until then, he is still in complete control over the rulers of this world because God's plan is being worked. We are headed, and we are there, into the last days. We are headed for, and we are getting into them now, the great falling away of Christianity. We are headed, and we are now into, the days when God said, this world will return to the days of Noah. The days of Noah are described Primarily by one word, great violence. God looked on the earth and there was great violence. That word violence in the Hebrew is not primarily in reference to war, but it is in reference to no respect for life. They cut off heads and, and laughed. They killed people for the fun of it and laughed. They were violent. No respect for life. Today, we have to get them before they even come out of the womb. Such violence. And they're a loud, cocky crowd. But they won't be. They won't be when they stand before God. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 1, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord as the rivers of water. He turneth it whithersoever he will. Our president, I do not believe, is a man of God, but I do believe he is God's man. To what degree of faith he has, I do not know, and I am not his judge. But if he has faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I wish it would affect him more. And the way he speaks and the lifestyle from which he lives. Say, but the things in his past, I don't know what is in a, a, a person's past. I'll tell you where the past belongs and the best place to put the past. Under the blood. That's the best place. To put your past.
President Trump is our president and our commander in chief, be it for our curse or be it for our blessing. I say the Lord has never once lost control of this nation or this election. God's plan is being worked. So the election didn't change the omnipotence of God. It didn't change the word of God, either written or incarnate. And it didn't change, number three, the love of God. Didn't change it. God still loves lost people and desires that they should come to the Savior. God still loves you. Titus chapter 3, verse 3, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts lust and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another, but after that, the kindness and love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Titus 3, verses 3 to 6. Do I even need to give you the reference on this? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. 2 Peter 3.9 for the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. If we have the love of God in our hearts, we must not lose that love. I am convinced that the worst of humanity is, being, is on display right now in America. It doesn't get much lower. It will get a little lower than this, but it doesn't get much lower. But I say this, they are like they are because they have not yet understood the love of God and the salvation of God. And I believe that many, many, many of them would not be like this if they knew the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. That being said, the election did not change things. We still have a mission. We still have a mission field. We still have a harvest and it's ripe and it's plenteous. What did God mean when he said the, the, the fields are white already unto harvest? Pray for laborers, pray for laborers, pray, pray for laborers. It's because there are more people who want to get saved than there are people who are willing to tell them how. Oh, God, help us. Can you get the depth of that statement? There are more people who want to get saved than there are people to tell them how. Sometimes God talks about standing in the gaps. There's a lot of those. He talks about many being called but few chosen. We have a mission. Regardless of what party rules this nation, what party occupies the uh, White House, regardless of what our future holds, we have a mission always and will always have one.
I'm glad this morning that we're freer to go about our mission than Christians in Iraq or Iran or the Soviet Union or many provinces in, in China or in Nepal where my daughter is and her family. It was hard before they came home. It was dangerous before they came home. They were home and now they've just returned to new legislation that if you get caught telling someone else about Christ, you're going to go to prison. And if you're an American, you will be expelled from the from the country immediately. But they aren't deterred. They're still teaching their people how to talk to others about Christ. I saw a picture of their young people's group. Uh, uh, they call it a feeding group. Uh, and they come uh, because they're too poor to have enough food, but uh, they get fed and then they, they share, share Jesus and they have Bible club right after that. And just older children and, and younger teenagers, there were about 60 of them. They still have a mission regardless of what the king has said. They still have a mission field. They still have a harvest. And we still have the promise to those who labor, we shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing our sheaves with us. Doug Ryder, before he was struck with dementia, he got saved rather late in life. He was making a lot of money in South Louisiana, he got saved. And God changed him overnight. Literally. He showed up for soul winning the first week, but he didn't know how. His pastor taught him how to talk to people about Christ. Week after week after week, he went. And he still did not have the opportunity to lead a soul to Christ. He went every single week without discouragement and talked to people about Christ. Still, he did not see anyone saved. But instead of being discouraged, he prayed harder. His desire to see people saved grew. And in the second year, God saw his faithfulness and the desire of his heart and began to see, allow him to see people saved. Pretty soon, Doug Ryder saw people saved just about every week of his life. By the time he came here and was assistant pastor under Brother Frederick, you only knew him as a great soul winner, one that won a lot of people to Christ. Can you relate to his beginning? Can you relate to say, you know, I've talked to people, uh, other than maybe in Sunday school or some other situation, I've never really out so many led someone to Christ. May I say this? Hang on to the promise. Keep on keeping on. And one day God will see your faithfulness and the desire of your heart. And he will allow you to begin to see his harvest harvested. 
it's not that we win people to Christ. We use that phrase a lot. Let me clarify. He allows us to see people saved after we have shared Christ with them. He does the saving. The Holy Spirit does the convicting. Hey, hey, God does the hard part. We just have to go out and get our hands around it and start bringing it in. And don't get discouraged when that happens slower than we want to. This election didn't change the fact that we have a mission, a mission field, a harvest, and a promise. This election did not change the love of God. And yet I end on a more solemn note. Number four, this election did not change the wrath of God. It did not change the wrath of God. Romans chapter 1, beginning at verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath showed it unto them, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things which are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagination. And their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise. They became fools and changed the glory of an uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and to four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness, to the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up to vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another. Men with men, working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil, uh, things disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. The election did not change the wrath of God. I listed it after the love of God because God would rather love you than punish you. He would rather have his love abound than his wrath to abound. It is the spirit that drives us to repentance, is it not?
the, the evil of this world will not win. And the evil influence, whether it be on them or on you or on me, will not win. Let us lock, walk righteously before God. And when he has faced us with our own sinful nature, let us repent on our knees and weep that we might be bearers of the love of God. That we might be usable. That we might be the instruments whereby people come to Christ. Everyone here will stand before Christ and face him. You will either face him as your salvation or you will face him as your damnation. Joshua 24, 15. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in which whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I'm glad I'm saved. I'm glad his, that the Lord Jesus Christ shed his blood in payment for my sin, although I firmly believe he paid too much for me. I wasn't worth it. But he loved me. Not sure why, but he did. And with my remaining days, I want to be as true as I can be. And I really do want to see people saved. And I want to be one of those that tell, that speak, that hand out gospel tracts. You could fill one more spot. There are more people out there, and I said this earlier, I'm going to close with this statement. There are more people out there that want to be saved then we have people to tell them how to be saved. But we, you, me, we can, we can fill one more spot. Let the love of God fill our lives toward lost people. And along the way, be patient. Lost people are going to act like lost people. Don't judge them like they were saved. Don't look at them like they should be like us. They can't be like us until they come to Christ. And for those who are putting off getting saved, please don't even do that one more day. At the great white throne judgment, there will be no commuted sentences. At the great white throne judgment, there will be no commuted sentences. It'll be too late. Too late. Let's pray. Lord, this morning, let us rejoice in these things that have not changed, for you do not change. Let us not trust in man, but trust in you. And regardless the future of this country, its government, regardless the future of the House or the Senate or the governors, Regardless of what you have,
plan for this country. Help us to know, to feel, to be secure and blessed in the fact that we know the Lord Jesus Christ and that you will not lay upon us more than we can bear. But in these last days, as we approach closer and closer to the rapture, help us, Lord, to be motivated to get our lives in spiritual order that we can and will be used in the harvest field and to actually witness and see people come to Christ through our effort. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask my wife to join me. We're going to go into invitation song. Our altar is always open, but if you are not sure you're on your way to heaven this morning, if you're not sure you've accepted Christ as your Savior and the forgiveness of sin, would you let my wife or I pray with you? Ladies, my wife is here to pray with you if you need her. Men, I'm here to pray with you down at the front if you need to receive Christ as your personal Savior. Shall we stand? And the music begins.